this second video, we're going to look at Act 2, working through each of the scenes and looking at some of the important lines that are emerging from these scenes, and also look at how the play is developing and what Shakespeare is doing through this development. You'll remember in the last video that we looked at the dramatic structure of a five-act tragedy. And let's look at that now. So Act 1 has done its role of the exposition. It's introduced us to the characters. It's told us about who they are. We have an idea about what the underlying story is. Uh, Antony's neglecting his duties in Egypt. Wars have been made in Rome. they are threats. He needs to go back. Cleopatra is very uh, manipulative and clingy and over the top and emotional. And she doesn't want him to go, but then she lets him go. And all seems well. Now in Act 2, we're going to see what the consequences of these things are. We're going to understand what have things been like in Rome? How have they been feeling about it? Uh, well, we know that already, actually. We've, we've seen what Octavius and Lepidus feel about Antony's actions. Um, and we're also going to learn about some of the other players in the play. So that's what happens there. And then obviously we build towards the climax, the crisis, the final suspense, and then the resolution, or in this case, catastrophe. But that we will uncover as we go forward through this journey. So let's get straight into the analysis. Act 2, Scene 1. What happens? Well, finally, we meet the much-discussed enemy of Rome, Pompey, or Pompey. It typically gets pronounced Pompey, but you can choose, really. Initially, Pompey is confident that he has the upper hand and that he will easily overpower Octavius and Lepidus. However, when he learns that Antony is returning from Egypt, his confidence subsides a bit. So that's significant in that he, he feels that Octavius and Lepidus are very easy to defeat. Uh, Octavius, because he is still very young and inexperienced, so Pompey believes he will be a, a better strategist. And Lepidus, because he is old and ineffectual and just not a very good soldier, really, he's past it. And as you've seen, he's quite a uh, gentle soul. You'll see that even more as we go through the, the rest of this act. So he's not very threatened by them. But then he hears Antony is coming back and he's uh, he goes, OK, well, that's that's worrying because he's worth more than the other two put together because he's experienced at battle. He's fought with brilliant generals. I mean, he fought with Julius Caesar. He... He knows his stuff and he's got a reputation. So that's important to know about Antony. And even Octavius will talk about uh, this idea going forward about how formidable a soldier Antony is. So, you know, that's that's something to know about him in terms of his characters. When you're building your character sketches, remember that Antony is a warrior. He's a professional soldier. We, ignorant of ourselves, beg often our own harms, which the wise powers deny us for our good. This is something that uh, his... Uh, Pompey's servant Minas says to him um, and essentially what he's he's arguing here is sometimes we ask for things which are kept from us because it's better if, they, if it's kept from us we you know that whole idea of be careful what you wish for um, it's kind of said here so this sort of light blue color I'm using for all the minor characters I didn't explain that in the last video this time I'll make that clear um, so he's just saying we are often denied that which we wish for because ultimately there's something better to come, um, which proves to be not entirely true for Pompey's sake. Um, remember, Pompey is the son of a former ruler of Rome. So he feels like he has a right to be the actual ruler. And he's been gathering a lot of following in, in Italy. Now, I don't want to go into too much depth about this, um, but it's important to know that the Italians have experienced a lot of political upheaval in the last few years. They've had numerous different leaders and different systems running them, and now this triumvirate thing is happening. And, you know, change is slow, especially if you're a poor person. So they often vote someone, well, not even vote, someone comes into power, and then they expect wonderful things to happen. And then they don't happen immediately, which means the people get upset and their allegiance switches very quickly. So that's something we even see today, really. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. The Roman people are described as slippery and fickle, and that's why they're siding with Pompey. Um, but their allegiance can be very easily pulled in the other direction. Pompey is in pink. I thought that was fitting. Were it not that we stand up against them all to a pregnant, they should square between themselves. Now, he is very observant about the fact that there are three very, very dominant men in the triumvirate. And he's saying that if we weren't opposing them, he means him and his pirates, 
then it's obvious that they would fight themselves, which proves to be quite prophetic because as soon as the distraction of Pompey is out of the way, well, Octavius turns his sights to other things and you will see that Pompey's words become true very, very soon, in fact. So that's just an interesting observation that it, the kind of their reputation and out in the rest of the world precedes them. The people kind of know what they're going to be like. Then he does point out, however, the fear of us may cement their divisions and bind up the petty difference. And what he means by that is that they, um, because of their united hatred for Pompey, it will join them together. It will make them stronger as a team because they've got one unified enemy. So he's very astute, uh, is Pompey. He knows a bit about war. He's risen to power not because he's an idiot, although later in this act you may disagree with that observation. Okay, and that's it for, for scene one. So we get to see the insight about the enemies, and it's important for us to get the other perspective on the triumvirate because obviously they can't say these things loudly amongst themselves, and this is Shakespeare's way of kind of telling us the understory because a bit of a spoiler here, you're not going to see much of Pompey um, after the end of this act. In fact, you're not going to see him at all. After the end of act two, Pompey very much disappears from the story and it becomes all about uh, Octavius and Antony. Right, scene two. The three members of the triumvirate are united once again and immediately there's tension. Antony and Octavius make numerous underhanded comments about who should sit where, neither wishing to give the impression that they can be ordered around by the other. Uh, I've made that sound like it's a long exchange. It's very quick, but it's important to look at the tension from the second they meet. When one says, have a seat. The other one says, no, you sit. He says, no, you will sit together. And then they're fine. And then they eventually, they sit. But it just gives you this, this immediate tension of leadership. Octavius blames Anthony Ford, amongst other things, neglecting his duty, allowing his wife and brother to cause trouble and not responding to requests for aid. And Anthony shrugs off each accusation, either by blaming it on his being drunk or hungover, or because Fulvia was a strong-willed woman who could not be controlled. Um, he does also get quite upset um, when he gets told he was um, he denied aid. He says, you're speaking on my honor. And he doesn't take that very kindly. He says, it's not that I denied it, I just neglected it. Um, but to be honest, his, his responses to the accusations aren't terribly convincing. If you think about things from Octavius's position, Octavius is saying, hey, you know, we're trying to run this empire. We're trying to keep it controlled. And while you're sitting having a, you know, partying it up in Egypt and having, you know, wild feasts and just living your sexual lust out, uh, the rest of us are trying to work and run an empire here. And Anthony's like, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. When it seems that the pair are at an impasse, and an impasse is where neither is going to give way, it's like they can't really make make do. Octavius essentially makes a statement saying, I don't understand how we're going to proceed further. It breaks my heart to say so, but oh, I can't be in an, in an alliance with you anymore. I don't understand how this is going to work. Agrippa suggests that Antony should take uh, Octavius's sister, Octavia, very original naming, um, thereby joining the two leaders of the family and creating peace. So he's saying, well, Anthony, you haven't got a wife anymore. Octavia doesn't have a husband. Her husband also died. So if they marry, then that makes you and Octavia's family with each other, which is means you shouldn't fight. You don't fight family, surely. Um, and that will be fantastic. So Caesar is immediately certain that Anthony's not going to accept, but Anthony does, and the group disband joyfully. So interestingly, um, the... <laughs> The, the exchange where Caesar's like, when Agrippa makes a suggestion, Caesar says, be careful that Cleopatra doesn't hear you or you'll lose your eyeballs. You know, he's basically, she'll come and gouge your eyes out. And Antony's response is, I am not married, which is quite interesting. He's ruling from his head, not from his heart. Or is he just doing the thing that he said in Egypt, I must from this beguiling queen break off, or this enchanting queen rather, break off. Um... Yeah, we kind of have this thing, is Antony really doing this or is he just making a political move? Is he being intelligent? Is he going, well, if I marry his sister, that is wise. It does stabilize things and keep me in power for a while. I guess we'll find out. At the start of the, uh, the scene, Antony says, I learn you take things ill which are not so or being concerned you not. In other words, you are being offended by things which shouldn't offend you. And even if they do, what, what concerns it of you? And that's this kind of reiteration that Antony is not someone who's going to be ordered around by Caesar, certainly not Caesar who is younger than he is. So 
this power dynamic is very important. Anthony is like, I am on equal footing with you. You are not my leader. So don't don't try and accuse me of things. Don't try and hold me up to any standards because you have no right to do so. He says, oh, by the way, Anthony is yellow. I'll play the penitent to you, but mine honesty shall not make poor my greatness, nor my power work without it. Um, and in fact, before this quote, he says, as near as I may. So in other words, in whichever instances I need to play the penitent, which means be the one who's apologizing, um, I'll do that. But I will not, in doing so, diminish my power. Okay, so when he's saying play the penitent in terms of, okay, I'll admit to where I've done something wrong. Um, but in doing so, that doesn't make me less than you. And he's making that very clear that even if I do say, okay, fine, I screwed up a bit. I didn't do something that I should have done. You can't then hold that against me or say, ha, I have a higher standing than you. No. That's the line I told you about. I'm not married, Caesar, which is important. And then lastly, Caesar says when he decides, okay, yes, this is going to happen. He says, a sister, I bequeath you whom no brother did ever love so dearly. Let her live to join our kingdoms and our hearts and never fly off our loves again. Um, this is quite important in terms of the foreshadowing because, well, those of you who've read ahead know that Antony doesn't stay with Octavia very long um, before he goes back to Cleopatra. I mean, the play, after all, is titled Antony and Cleopatra. That's, you know, that should come as a bit of a warning. Um, so what Antony is effectively doing is creating a temporary plaster on a wound that he's then going to rip off prematurely just to make it worse. Um, he's just going to anger Octavius even more. He's going to double offend him. So it's a bit ironic what Caesar is saying here. And it's important that he says, a sister who no, no brother ne did ever love so dearly. In other words, he really loves his sister. He's very fond of her. He's very close to her. And anybody who messes with her is going to pay the price. Well, there you go. Then we continue with scene two. There's this weird sort of side part. So that's that group goes away. Um, so the triumvirs prepare to, prepare to strategize against Pompey and they leave. Enobarbus and Agrippa, who are, and if Enobarbus is Anthony's like right-hand man, um, and Agrippa is one of Caesar's generals, they talk about Egypt. Enobarbus tells Agrippa about what life there is like and describes Antony and Cleopatra's relationship. He also speaks about the first time the pair met, which reveals rather a lot about them. So the thing about the scene is you do need to take it with a little pinch of salt, um, which means don't necessarily take it on face value, because Enobarbus is obviously going to brag. He's coming back to a friend who's never been to Egypt. So he's going to sort of talk things up a little bit. Um, and all his descriptions of Egypt are really, you know, he says that we've had these massive feasts where everyone had like, there were 12 boars on the table and, and he goes more and wine more than you could possibly imagine. And he just paints the scene of total and utter excess. So that's just taken with a little pinch of salt. But when he talks about Antony and Cleopatra's relationship, that is worth paying attention to because he's giving us insight into who they are and how they operate. It's telling us a little bit about what has just happened. It's Shakespeare almost telling us, don't worry, Antony hasn't gone off Cleopatra. His right-hand man is absolutely convinced that it's not going to last. He says, when she first met Mark Antony, she pursed up his heart. In other words, it was love at first sight for Antony. She stole his heart. His heart belonged to her from the moment they first met. And that's important because it's true. You'll see all the way to the end of the play, Antony is completely and utterly uh, besotted with Cleopatra, no matter what she does, literally, no matter what she does. She betrays him, she stabs him in the back, she lies to him, and yet every time, even when he's ready to kill her, somehow she manages to get the upper hand, so she has indeed pursed up his heart. Enobarbus is orange. For her own person, it beggared all description. What he means is it's impossible to describe how beautiful she is. So remember I said take it with a pinch of salt. He's trying to sort of ham it up. But I think it's also Shakespeare's way of telling us that, look, Cleopatra really was a very, very beautiful woman. You must remember Antony is not the first Roman leader she has uh, seduced. She talks about other ones. She Pompey's, I think it's his brother who's also called Pompey. They like to keep it in the name because Pompey's dad was also Pompey. So, you know, um, they just, they like the name, obviously. It's like George Foreman, the boxer. If you don't believe me, go Google. I think he has seven sons. All of their names are George. Um, anyway, so he's saying Cleopatra, she, she is indescribable. 
And I think that's that's Shakespeare's way of telling us that, look, she really is something else. That's why everyone kind of just bows down to her, really, because she's so magnificent. And he paints the scene of her having this golden ship and with purple sails and perfumes that drifted through the city and drew all the people out. And, yeah, he really, really paints this dreamlike thing. So she's quite magnificent, supposedly. She makes hungry where most she satisfies. So he's, uh, sorry about those being commas. I didn't see those were commas. They're supposed to be dots. Um, but she, he says she makes hungry where most she satisfies, meaning normally when you get satisfied by something, so let's say even if it's the best ice cream in the world, I'm pretty sure that most of you won't be able to eat, let's say, maybe a two-liter tub, but say a five-liter tub. That's the really big tub of ice cream in one sitting. I doubt anyone can, can do that. I mean, I can hear some of you already going challenge accepted and be my guest. Um, but for most of us, you can't have too much of a good thing. After a while, it's it becomes oversweet or it becomes, you get bored of the same flavor. So in Cleopatra's case, what she does is the more you have, the more you want. So he's just implying that this is how Antony is kind of completely addicted to Cleopatra because she makes hungry where most she satisfies rather than she satisfies. And that's that for scene two. So again, this background is just to give us insight into what's happening in, in the background. It's it's important so that we can see about the characters because obviously they can't stand on the stage and just tell us their inner thoughts all the time. So having the sort of right-hand man tell us a bit about things, it's important to understand the backstory. All right, scene three. The scene opens with Anthony and Octavia talking. Anthony tells her that there will often be times where his duty will call him away from her and she pledges her loyalty to him before heading to bed. Anthony then meets with a fortune teller, another fortune teller, who advises him to stay away from Octavius because in his presence, all Anthony's luck deserts him. Anthony confirms that this has been true in the past. He then decides to commence an attack against Parthia, which is a region in the east. There should be a full stop at the end of that. I'm really nailing the grammar today. Sorry, the punctuation, I mean. There we go, even better. Um, and basically what, what we find out here is you get some sense of this relationship happening between uh, Anthony and and Octavia, you get a sense of what the relationship is like. It's very, uh, what's the word? It's very tame. It's very, you know, not, not fiery and passionate. And, you know, Barbara's comments on this, he says, there's no way she's going to be the right woman for, for Anthony. She's, she's too mild mannered. Anthony needs someone who's fiery like he is. Cleopatra is the right person for him. And, um, yeah, and then we see that Antony is still a soldier. He knows what he's doing. He can strategize militarily. So that's what he he does. And also, obviously, learning this thing about Octavius' luck around him, he kind of gets a little bit uneasy, and he thinks, hmm, I need to get away from him. This is the fortune teller. Remember, minor characters are blue. Near him, thy angel becomes a feared as being overpowered. Therefore, make space enough between you. So your your spirit, that kind of your, your guardian angel, it gets scared, and it gets overpowered. So get get distance between you guys i will to egypt and though i make this marriage for my peace in the east my pleasure lies antony says this to himself he points out that he is doing the marriage not for anything else but for being politically astute because in the east which is where cleopatra is my pleasure lies so it's interesting that he kind of separates peace and pleasure and that in a way is a bit of foreshadowing because he doesn't get either apologize for the hardy does making a racket okay this is quite a straightforward line i i think if you can try and learn a quote here in the east my pleasure lies and if you write in the east that's okay no no ieb marker is going to mark you down um and there's the hardy does again maybe i should uh, just add at this point as a as an ieb marker what we look at okay is when we're looking in through your essays, we're not looking for absolute pinpoint precision in terms of the quotation. So like if you can't remember where the comma needs to go um, or if if they say thy or your, we're not going to punish that. It's if you change a quote that it absolutely says something fundamentally different, then you're going to get into trouble. So if you're not sure of what the main message and you can say I, I would say have an 85 percent i mean that's a very random step but an 85 percent accuracy rating on a quote if you can't do that then just paraphrase it rather um we won't necessarily penalize you because you're not quoting i mean obviously quoting is first prize because it shows you really have learned the play very well but um 
If you can't do that, then then paraphrase. So as I said, in this instance, if you said, um, and although I am, I make this marriage for my peace in the East, my heart lies, we will probably still give that a tick. We'll say, you know what, you're close enough. Okay, obviously try to be accurate, but don't panic about it. Right, on to scene four. This, it just moves the plot along. It doesn't do anything. There are no quotes I want to, to bring up here. Lepidus simply informs Mecenas and Agrippa to assemble their forces and head toward My Mycenaeum, where they plan to confront Pompey and his forces. Just to give us an idea about where everyone's going, what's happening. Um, remember, Shakespeare doesn't have stage props and backdrops when he's doing this, so he can't really show us where he is. And he can't just have somebody waltz onto the stage and go, we are near Mount Marcinum, and off he walks again. It'll be a bit lame. So he does this scene to just kind of tell us where we're going. So act five, um, I mean scene five, excuse me. So again, to cut. So now we know that everyone is traveling to this mount. What's happening in the meantime? Back in Egypt, the news of Antony's marriage to Octavia reaches Cleopatra, who does not take it well. Surprise, surprise. Um, at first, she does not allow the messenger to, to deliver his news, showing how impulsive and impatient she is. She promises him uh, gold. She doesn't let him finish his sentences. She jumps to quick conclusions. She's, yeah, she, it's a bit irritating, actually. When he finally is able to deliver his message, she flies into a complete rage, vouching to gouge his eyeballs out, have him whipped and soaked in salt water to dry out the pain. She even draws a knife, almost in preparation to kill him. She has to get kind of held off and the messenger runs away. Um, the messenger also, he comes, goes often on the stage and she threatens him several times. She kind of says, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, so just tell me, so he's with, what's her name again, Octavia? Octavia, you, you, how dare you? Why did you lie to me? So she, she's very impulsive. She like, she basically criticizes him for not lying to her. She's like, you shouldn't bear bad news so heavily. You should be, you know, gentler about it. Anyway, it's quite a good indication of her, uh, of her impulsivity and how she doesn't really care about others and how everything needs to be about her. Anyway, after she calms down, she tells her handmaidens to learn what Octavia looks like, which is quite interesting. She says, some innocents escape not the thunderbolt, meaning some innocent people will get harmed in the process. It's not, you know, they, it's it's too bad, which is quite, quite mean, really, if you think about it. Um, she's again showing that she doesn't really care for other people besides herself she puts herself first always 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 throughout the play you will see that cleopatra puts herself first even when antony is dying at the end and he begs one last kiss from her lips she's like no i'm not leaving my monument i'll get captured you come up to me so you know she's she's very self-interested and in this instance we see that again she's not remorseful about the fact that she's threatening someone who's innocent she's like tough in praising Antony, I have dispraised Caesar. We also see that she's not quite as airheaded as perhaps she gives the impression of being. We spoke about that in Act 1, where she said, I'll play the fool. Um, this is the thing where she realizes, oh goodness, I have been praising Antony, and in doing so, I have dispraised, I have been criticizing Caesar. That means I'm on the back foot. I'm in a bad position here. She realizes that this is potentially going to come back to bite her in the backside. Though he be painted one way like a gorgon, the other way is a Mars. Now, a gorgon is a uh, a monster. It's If you know about Medusa, the woman who had the snakes for hair, um, and if she, you looked at her with the naked eye, um, she would um, turn you to stone. That's a gorgon. And what she's saying is, in this instance, he appears to be like this monster because he's breaking her heart. I mean, she's so devastated to learn this news. You know, how could he go away, promise her that his heart belonged to her, and then what does he do? He gets married. Um, but she says the other ways are Mars. Mars is the god of war. So she still can't quite hate him. She still has very fond feelings for Antony. She's drawn to him. And that's also the kind of thing about this couple is, yes, she's very self-serving and Antony's also politically astute, but ultimately they keep coming back to each other because they are in reality a perfect match, albeit not a very productive or healthy one. Scene six. The triumvirate meet with Pompey, and after a brief discussion where Pompey names the crimes that have been committed against his father, which he feels he is right to expect to avenge, they ultimately reach a peace agreement. Pompey points out that he was a good host to Antony's mother when she needed shelter, and Antony apologizes for not showing more gratitude. And after this, everyone is like friends. Um, basically, Antony points out, look, you might have an advantage by, this, by sea, but our forces outmatch you by land. You haven't got a chance. Um, I think you should... You know, give up. Um, Pompey also then points out, but I'll get to that. He points out that you only have that which you stole, 
and it can just as easily be stolen back, um, which is interesting. After the leaders go back onto the, go onto the ship to feast, Enobarbus remains behind with one of Pompey's men, Minas, who confesses that he feels Pompey has been a fool. He thinks that he's given up this opportunity. Enobarbus discloses that he believes the marriage between Antony and Octavia will not last and will cause a great lift in his and Caesar's relationship. Oh, so Shakespeare puts another little bit in here just to kind of, again, give us that backstory, give us insight into what the characters are really like. At land, indeed, thou dost overcount me of my father's house. But since the cuckoo builds not for himself, remain it as thou must, as thou mayest. So what he's saying is, fine, yes, you do overcount me. You do have more than I have of my father's house. In other words, Italy, which used to belong to his father. Um, but since the cuckoo builds not for himself, a cuckoo is a bird that lays its eggs in other birds' nests. When the birds go away, they leave their eggs, and then the cuckoo lays one egg. And their chick is typically much bigger than the other chicks, and it pushes all the babies out and then steals all the food for itself. Um, so it gets raised by other parents. That's how cuckoos do it. Um, he's just accusing them of being like usurpers or th or thieves of this country. And he's like, fine, you can keep it. Um, because he's almost like insulting. Like, fine, keep what you stole. As an aside, Mina says, thy father, Pompey, would never have made this treaty. And he is astute. He observes that you are losing out. Because basically Pompey gets given an island and he still has to make tributes to Rome. It's a bit of a stupid deal, really. Um, and he also has to rid the Mediterranean of pirates. And it's not quite clear why he makes the, the trade. And it ends up really coming back to bite him in the backside. But we'll talk about that later. Pompey doth this day laugh away his fortune. This is what Mina says to Eno Barber. So he's saying he's, he's giving away all his opportunities. And then this is Eno Barber's. Oh, I should have made him orange. You shall find the band that seems to tie their friendship together will be the very strangler of their amity. So at the moment, the band, the wedding band that seems to tie them together, keep them together as friends, is going to be the thing that ultimately kills their good nature for each other. And he's right. Right, on to scene seven. On board one of Pompey's ships, the feast is well underway, and most of the characters are fairly drunk. Lepidus is so drunk that he cannot tell when he's being teased. Uh, Minas takes Pompey aside and points out that they're in the perfect position to kill all three of the triumvirs and seize the Roman Empire, but Pompey curses him for revealing the plan. He says that his honor forbids him from double-crossing his new allies. But had Minas simply gone ahead and murdered them, then he could have enjoyed the benefits. Minas declares Pompey a fool behind his back and abandons him. So this is an interesting scene because like all the rest of us sort of watch it and go, yes, you've got them on board your ship, you've got more soldiers than they do, you literally can kill them. And then you are the ruler of Rome. And he goes, no, my honor forbids it. I will not. I'm nothing if I don't have my honor. And Minas just goes, no, I can't deal. These three world sharers, these competitors are in thy vessel. Let me cut the cable. And when we are put off, fall to their throats. All there is thine. So he points out how easy it will be. Cut the, drop the anchor, go far out to sea, cut their throats. And that's it. You have a bit of a red wedding scenario. Um, yeah, and... Pompey is not, not pleased with this. He says, In me, tis villainy. In thee, it had been good service. Thou must know, tis not my profit that does lead my honour, my honour it. So I am not led by monetary or uh, territorial gain. I am led by honour. And Minas goes, Ah, that's it, there's no way. I can't. And that is how the act ends. So, what have we learnt? Well, despite the tense atmosphere, the triumvirate have settled their differences and are united force once again. That's, Im that's important, not for long though. Antony is willing to make personal sacrifices for political gain. He married Octavia. So we know that he also, he does things that against what he really wants to do, just because he thinks it's politically astute. Three, Cleopatra is still madly in love with Antony and is devastated to learn of his marriage. Yep, so that's also important. We know that she doesn't just say, well, damn him, he can rot and he must disappear. No, she's devastated. Pompey has been appeased with the treaty. And remember that the soothsayer, the fortune teller, has prophesied that Antony will ultimately lose to Octavius. So this is all sitting in the background. Now, the other thing I want to talk to you about in terms of Act 2 is that we start to see these ideas of themes developing. So what are themes? Uh, themes are, if you just think about this little diagram, themes are these ideas which run through the text. They might take on different shapes and forms. They might result in different things or end up going an alternative way. 
but they ultimately communicate the same truth or idea. So the the comparison between Rome and Egypt, the passion versus reason uh, thing is a theme. When you look at how often we see Rome portrayed as being stoic, emotionless, logical and focused, and how often we look at Egypt being this passionate, impulsive, artistic, sensual world. That happens again and again and again and again. But there are others. So a theme, as I've said, is an ideal concept that is explored in a variety of ways throughout the text. So let's see what themes have developed since Act 1. I'm going to show you one other theme, and that is the theme of appearance versus reality. Okay, so when things look like they are one way, but in the other way, they're not. So let's think of an example. Antony is marrying Octavia. He, we all know as the audience that he's not doing this because he loves her, because he thinks she's pretty, or because he thinks it's a good idea. Well, he does because it's a good idea, but that's the only reason he thinks it's a good political idea. Though I make this marriage for my peace in the East, my pleasure lies, he says. So we know that this is not really what he wants. You know, Barbas knows that's not what he wants. Um, we can look at the idea of Minas being... Uh, the kind of good host letting all the triumvirs in the boat when we know that secretly he's plotting in his head to kill all of them, but Pompey says no. But that's an appearance versus reality situation. Um, what other ones can we have? The fact that Inobarbus looks like he's a loyal, devoted uh, servant to Antony all the time, and I suppose he is, but he is still willing to talk behind his back, which is still something worth talking about. But I think one of the best lines to look at here is when Cleopatra says, though he painted one way like a Gorgon, the other way is a Mars, and we spoke about before. So what you can do, if you're going to do some work around these videos, I don't know if you are, I can, uh, how people are using them is entirely up to you, but I'm just putting material out there for your own benefit. Um, doing this type of stuff, answering these questions, trying to unpack them, going and looking for evidence is the best way of studying, because it forces you to engage with these ideas, and it forces you to go through that habit of finding evidence from the text which means you have to revisit the text, which means you learn it. Um, and I know it might seem tedious for some of you, especially for those of you for whom reading Shakespeare is like pulling teeth, I get it. But I'm trying to do this in ways that make it easier because obviously you want to write this exam and you want to do as well as you can. English is an important grade for university entrance. Um, those of you just looking to pass, well, this might be the thing that helps get you over the edge and get you a little bit further. So I would recommend you do these things, you play around with stuff. So I'm not necessarily gonna unpack all of these questions. Um, I'm going to leave it to you to go and explore because in so doing you'll exercise your brain muscles and that's really what you want to be doing. Okay, but for this first one, what ways are these true? Well, we've seen, as I just said, he's willing to make political decisions where he needs to. He is able to put on a smiling front when he has to, but in the background he's always plotting and hatching. He knows that he wants to get away from Octavius because of what the fortune teller says. He know he wants to get back to Cleopatra, even though he's promised Octavia marriage, and he knows that it's going to anger Octavius. So in that regard, he is painted one way like a Gorgon, the other way is a Mars. In other words, he's not always what he seems. Are there other characters who display a similar trait? That is, they act one way in company, but in reality, they have different motivations or feelings. I listed some other ones before. Um, I have a feeling that we don't see enough about Octavius to get a sense of what he's really plotting, and we'll see at the beginning of Act 3, that's certainly true that he is not quite as benign or gentle as perhaps he seems to be. Um, and I, I mentioned Minas, I mentioned Eno Barbas. We can see if there are other characters. Like Cleopatra, has she displayed qualities like this? And what evidence do you have for saying so? So if you don't think she is, you think that Cleopatra, because she's so emotional, she's she. what you see is what you get. She's not not that at all then fine, then motivate that and explain why the fact that she wears her heart on her sleeve makes her seem like that. Or you can argue contrarily, you can say absolutely she she is uh, practices appearance versus reality. She even admits right in the beginning that she's going to pretend to be the fool she isn't when she listens to um, Anthony. And we know that she can be restrained or she can fly into a rage. Well, I suppose the restraint is not something she really displays. We also know that she's had many lovers before, so she's a good seductress, which means she must have some powers of convincing. Okay, and then what is the significance of your answer? So if she is a manipulator, is this not an example of her, you know, just uh, being, what's the word I'm looking for? Just manipulative, or is she, <clears throat> excuse me, or is she, uh, an innocent sort of bystander who's watching things happen. I don't really think that's the case at all. That's it for 
Act two. I don't have any exercises in the, the comments this time, but we will probably have some things to do in act three. Please pop me a comment if there are things that you want me to go over or which you're not understanding or if you'd like me to do in more depth, and I'll certainly do that. Until the next time, have a wonderful whatever time it is, evening, morning, day. And best of luck with all the assessments coming up prelims soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>